If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to be continuing there this morning. We're going to be talking about blessings this morning. About there will be blessings. Christmas is not canceled this year. Blessings happened many, many years ago when Christ was announced and blessings will continue to happen today. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about what Brent was just talking about, but he kind of stole it. You know, it is amazing to watch people worship and to truly worship. And it is, as Brent said, one of those fulfilling things just to look around and know you're in the midst of pe- a group of people worshiping. I like to watch people. Uh, we went to New York a few years ago and I sat in Times Square. My favorite thing in the world was just to sit down on a bench in Times Square and watch people. I didn't really care about shopping or going to any of the stores or anything like that. I just wanted to watch people walk up and down Times Square. And that was the most fulfilling thing for me. And so is, is I like to watch people. I like to look around and, you know, just sometimes see, kind of get an idea of how things are going. And so uh, I've been many mornings, Sunday mornings, standing at the back until the last song because I just get a different feel from the back than I do sitting in the front with my back to everyone. And this morning as worship started, man, it was, it was you know, high energy, man, it was exciting. I looked over here on the side pew and George was over here just dancing like crazy, man. He was worshiping. Man, little kids, just to watch them be involved in worship, it's just it's so exciting to, to hear. And then to hear the kids singing throughout the, the congregation, what a, what a cool thing. And then I glanced around, and, and Jennifer and Maury are back here, and they're dancing back here on the back wall, too. So you miss stuff when you got your back to them. So, man, they had their arms up, and they were just getting after it. And so, you know, it's just, it's just cool to see people involved in worship. And then I, I glanced all the way to the right, and Troy Thomas is getting into it, too. He's going. <laughs> I saw you, man. You nodded your head. I saw you. You were into it. And so, and then, you know, you just kind of go back around the room and some people, you know, they're, they're just a little nervous to get into it. They're a little, just let loose and worship, man. I mean, I, I promise we won't get charismatic. Just let loose and worship. It's okay to raise your hand. It's okay to get involved in worship. God is awesome. And uh, this morning I want to talk to you about blessings. Luke chapter one, beginning in verse 39, we're going to continue our story up to the birth of Christ. And, and you know, there, there's this whole little passage here from verses 39 over to, to 56 that is just centered around the blessing of Christmas and the blessing of, of Christ and, and what it all meant. And, you know, I, I just believe there's, we're due for a blessing. Don't you think so? You know, you think about this whole last year. I know everyone's getting excited about Oh, 2020 is ending. In just like, what, 17, 18 days or so, it'll be gone. And everybody's excited. 2020 will be over. I'm not sure 2021 is going to be a lot better. But we're excited about 2020 disappearing and going away. And, and so I think we're kind of due for a blessing. You know, I mean, I know several times throughout this year, you know, something will happen that's just like, oh, man. And I'm like, well, isn't that a blessing? No, it's really not. Did anybody ever do that? You know, just kind of take something that's negative and say, isn't that a blessing? Well, no, it's really not a blessing. I'm going to share with you what blessings really are this morning. And, and the blessing came, as we know, from uh, the first week of our study, and, and Christmas is not canceled, about uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth getting the announcement that John the Baptist would be born. The blessings began there, and, and uh, Keith brought that to you all that morning, and and just shared with you how, how what an awesome experience it was for them to, to be able to, to birth the, the child who was going to come before Christ. Who was going to announce to the world who he was. And then uh, just last week or so we talked about the birth of Jesus being foretold. And how, how the angel came to, to Mary. And, and, and so as, as the angel leaves Mary, something very interesting happens here. It says that in verse 39 that after this was announced to her, remember we talked last week about Mary didn't say, 
well, uh, you know, are you really going to do this? She said, how are you going to do this? She was willing, she was ready, she was available, and she was wanting the Lord to use her. And as soon as the angel departed from her, it tells us in verse 39 that in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. You know, I guess I've read this story many, many times. And as I was studying this week over this passage, I guess I'd never really thought about it in, that, in depth, but didn't realize that quite possibly, and most theologians believe this could be true, is that Mary didn't tell her family. She didn't tell Joseph. She didn't tell anyone. She just jumped up and headed to Elizabeth's house. I guess I'd never really thought about it like that, but she jumped up. It says, in those days, she arose and went quickly with haste. She got up after that angel had said that, and she left. So no one knew of the Christ child that was going to be born, quite possibly, except Mary herself. Mary was the only person on earth, quite possibly, that, that even knew that this was going to happen. Except for maybe Zachariah and Elizabeth had a hint that the Christ child was going to come. But only Mary knew how and where and when. And she arises and she goes to the hill country, to the town of Judah. It's believed to have been some 50 miles or so away. It was a journey for her. And, and she went there and she entered into the house of Zechariah. And there she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Mary, uh, Elizabeth is now six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And, and as, as, as Mary enters the household, as she greets Elizabeth, the child leaped in her womb. You know, we think a lot of times about revelation of things and how things are revealed to people. I want you to see this as we continue on reading verses 40, 41, 42, how this birth was revealed to Elizabeth. It wasn't revealed to Elizabeth in the same way it was revealed to Mary. It was revealed to Elizabeth through the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 says, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we think a lot of times that, that the Holy Spirit, uh, what is it, Acts chapter 4, when it comes and Peter re receives the Holy Spirit and the, and the disciples and, you know, all of those people receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that that's the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in the, in the people, uh, in God's people. But, but no, the Holy Spirit's been worked long ago, even from the beginning of time. The Spirit moved among the waters, Remember? And the Holy Spirit's been at work all of this time. And in the Holy Spirit here, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the joy of that? When Mary walks through the door and says, hello, the child within her leaps for joy. And Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. Can you imagine the joy of that moment? To have a, a realization of what was really happening in their life. They were about to birth the child that was going to go before the Savior of the world. And he was going to announce who the Savior of the world was. And he was going to make that known to man. And then, lo and behold, her cousin walks through the door. Her young cousin walks through the door. You know, we don't know exactly how old Mary was, but most people believe she was just a teenager at the time. And she walks through the door, and Mary realizes immediately, oh my gosh, she's going to have the Christ child. What an amazing moment that was. I, I just would have loved to have been in the room just to see that and experience that and the joy of what's happening there. I want you to go with me and look at one passage of scripture this morning. John chapter 3, verse 29. Flip with me there real quickly this morning. John chapter 3, verse 29, we see where John the Baptist is acknowledging Christ as 
later on. This is probably some 30 years later. Verse 29, it says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. John the Baptist is saying, you know, here is the bridegroom. Here is the Christ. Here is the Savior of the world. And, and as a, himself, he wanted everyone to understand and to know that he wasn't the Christ. He wasn't the one people have been looking for. He was a friend of the bridegroom. And as, as, this, as Christ comes on the scene, he says, but the, as the friend of the bridegroom, he stands and hears his voice. He rejoices greatly at that. You know, it's interesting that he uses that kind of illustration of, of who Christ is in the moment there, but that wasn't the first time that happened. The first time that happened was right here on this day when Mary walks through the door and the Christ child is just being conceived some just very few days before, maybe three or four days before, enters the house and John knows who it is while he's still in the womb. You know, I, I could go off right here and preach a lot about the sanctity of life, abortion, about when a child knows something, about when, I mean, this is the perfect passage to show that a child in the womb, now, now I, don't get me wrong, I know there's some spiritual things going on here. Don't get me wrong, but just... For a child to have the ability for that to happen proves to us about the sanctity of life and when a life is real. What a day. What a time. And immediately, Elizabeth, as she was filled with the Holy Spirit, she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. And we see the first blessing here that, that, that Elizabeth uh, brings out and, and it shows that Mary is so blessed. She was chosen by God to be the mother of the Savior of this world. And she said, Mary, you are blessed among women. I, I was thinking about that this week. What, what made Mary so special? Was it that she was just this pure perfect specimen of a human being. I believe she was a very good person, but, you know, that, that really wasn't what made her so special. What, was she the, the best daughter that their, her parents ever had or the best child? I, I don't know that that would be true because I believe just like we are, Mary was human just like us. I believe Mary made some of the same mistakes we do. She made some of this. I bet she argued with her brothers and sisters over toys and stuff in the yard. I bet she probably didn't clean her room always perfectly. But you know what was so special about Mary? She was chosen. That's what was special about her. She was chosen by God. And what I want you to see this morning, although... This is, the, this is the epitome of, of the, the greatest choosing that you could ever imagine would be to be the mother of the Christ, the mother of the Savior of the world. What I want you to see is that what makes you special when God uses you is not your status in this world or not your behavior or the way you've acted or... What makes you special when God chooses to use you is that he has chosen you. That's what makes you special. And, and if you look all through scripture and you look around and seeing people that God's using, you will see for sure that God doesn't always pick the most perfect. God doesn't always pick the, the best looking or the greatest speakers. Or I mean, I can prove that to you right now. I mean, I, I know God's used me over the years and I'm not the best looking. I'm not the greatest speaker in the world. I think Becky thinks so, and I'm glad she does, but she tells me that anyhow. I don't know if she's lying or not, but it's that God chooses us. And if God is calling you to do something, I want you to take, I just want you to understand that 
it's, if he's choosing you, you are blessed. If he's choosing you for something, if he's calling you to something, you are blessed. It's an awesome experience. And Mary was blessed among women, not because of who she was, but because God chose her. God picked her. And then she goes on and she says, and she, uh, and, and she said, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Uh, Elizabeth knew immediately that the, the child in, in Mary's womb was the Savior. We have no indication that Mary had even told her this. When she walked through that door as she was filled with the Holy Spirit, she knew. I don't think Mary walked in and said, hey, I'm pregnant. I don't think she did that. I think she just walked in the door and said, hey, and it was revealed. Mary, you know, Elizabeth knew. The baby in her womb knew the child within her was blessed. And then Elizabeth does what many of us should do many times. Is she just takes a step back and just revels in the concept that God is using her also. She says, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Why am I so blessed? You know, not only was Mary blessed, not only was the baby blessed, but Elizabeth was realizing she also was being blessed. That she was getting to be a part of this. That she was getting to, to just see this in, a, in an up-close way. Man, I tell you, there is no greater fulfillment in ministry than to see your people be a part of something that is blessing someone else. I, I tell you, that's one of the greatest rewards for me in ministry is when, when someone calls you up and says, hey, man, let me tell you what I got to do today, how I got to be a help to someone, how I got to serve someone. I, I mean, that is the greatest fulfillment in ministry. Because like Brent, Brent said a while ago about just about worship, it's, it's kind of the picture of you see that we're getting it. We're getting it. We're seeing what it means to, to serve another person and to be used by God. It's a blessing, folks. You know, sometimes you get a phone call or someone, you know, contacts you or comes up to you and says, man, I need some help or I need this or I need that. And it may not be the thing that you want to do at that moment. But I want you to realize is that it's a blessing that God's given you the opportunity to be involved in that. It's just a different way of looking at it. You know, Elizabeth could have looked at it and said, man, I'm old. This is going to be hard. This is going to be tough. And, and, and I, But she didn't. She just said, oh, it's so awesome. I get to be a part of this. Verse 44 says, for behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. She restates what had happened to Mary. And she said, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. She again here blesses Mary in saying that you are blessed because you believed that this would be fulfilled. Going right back to the last Sunday sermon when the angel told her Mary didn't doubt, Mary didn't shy away, Mary, Mary just believed. Mary just believed that God was going to use her in a mighty way. She believed that through her, the Christ child would be born. She just believed. You know, sometimes that's all the Lord's asking of us, is that we just believe. That we just have faith. That we just step forward in faith and not in fear. We step forward in faith and not doubt. We step forward in faith and not worry about what the consequences would be. That we just step forward. And allow God to use us in any way that he would have. You know, Mary said at the end of the passage last week, just, Lord, here I am, just take me and use me. That's what God wants from us. That's what God's looking for us for. And I want you to see something here before we move on to the next section. 
Mary was blessed. I believe she already knew that, that she was getting to serve the Lord in this way. But I want you to see how God used Elizabeth to voice those blessings back to Mary. You see, God uses people to, to show what he's really doing even, among, even in our own lives sometimes. That's why having a church family is so important. Because we, we talked about this Thursday night in our life group meeting, how being a part of a, of a church family, you know, sometimes there are things that someone else may see that God's doing in your life that you might not even be aware of yet. And, and, and then they can, might walk up to you and say, you know, I've been seeing this in you. I saw this about you. And the next thing you know, you see that start moving. Because God doesn't always reveal it just to us, but he reveals it to others also. And that's exactly what was happening here. Through Elizabeth, not only was, was Mary being, not only was she understanding completely that this was happening and it was true, but Elizabeth was even saying, even instilling in her how blessed she was that God was using her in that way. It was coming full circle. It was complete, completely understood at this point. Can, can you imagine just the, there's no coincidence here, but can you just imagine how all of these little puzzle pieces are coming together and Mary's known for six months that, that she's going to have John the Baptist, the one who's going to proclaim Christ, and then all of a sudden when Mary walks in the door and she realizes she is carrying the Christ child, how this whole thing just went, whoop, it's together now. There was no doubt in any of their, their lives. See, I believe that's what the church family does for each other. That we come together, we solidify each other, we build each other up, we, we help each other when times of need, we, we walk through things together. God uses people. Then we see here, as, as he said, you know, blessed is the one who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Then something very interesting happens. Lots of rain. Here we go. Mary breaks out in a song. You know, I, when I read this this week, I said, you know, it's just about like some of these movies you watch sometimes. You're watching a movie and the plot gets out, and all of a sudden you find out it's a musical. And all they break out in song, and then they're singing the whole movie after that. I, I really don't like those kind of movies. But it's kind of, that's the kind of the picture of what happens in this situation. Is that Elizabeth is speaking and blessing Mary. Mary just breaks out in a song and then she sings the rest of the theme of this passage. And it, it's a song of joy for her. And I want us to go through that this morning before we leave today. She starts out and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary begins her song with sharing about what God has done for her. You know, it's not about what she's going to do for God. It's about what God has done for her. You know, it would have been very easy to take a different stance on this and she could have said, oh, look at me, look what I'm going to do for God. I'm going to have the Christ child. And that was not her attitude at all. She was, her attitude was, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on me, the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on the generations will call me blessed. Not because of who she is, not because of what she's going to do, but because God has looked upon her and he has allowed her to serve him in this way. She rejoices for what God has done for her. And then in verse 48, we see that she rejoices that God has been mindful of her. She said, he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. You know, I, I think sometimes we, 
we get this feeling because we get so wrapped up in life and so wrapped up in, in, in the things that we do and the things of this world that I think sometimes we let ourselves go to a place where we don't really think that, that God is really mindful of us. I mean, it's a big world. There's a lot of people. And sometimes I think we just let ourselves sink into this place where we think, yeah, God's not really, he doesn't really think about me. He doesn't, is he really concerned with me? Well, here's what I want you to know. Yes, he is. He's that big. He's that powerful. He's that awesome that he, that he is mindful of you. He is mindful of the things that are going on in your life. And you can see the humbleness of Mary here saying, it's just amazing to me that he would choose me. That he would choose me. He said, look what God's done for me. I want to ask you this morning just to think for a second. What's God done for you? You ever just stop and think about that? What's God done for you? I bet we could make a long list if we really just stopped and thought about it. What's God done for you? The next question is, have you thanked him for it? That's what Mary's doing here. She said, oh, man, look, God, look what God's done for me. And she's thanking him for this. She's rejoicing and thanking God for what he's doing in her life. You know, we just need to slow down sometimes and really consider that. What all he's done for us and the thankfulness of our hearts for it. Verse 49, we see that she starts talking about God's might here as she's singing. She said, for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And what we see here is that she understands that God has been mighty for her. Not only has he, he been mindful of her, but she's, he's mighty for her too. She, he's done something. He has performed a miracle here. He has done something that, is, that has never been done before and will never be done again. And she realizes the power of God. And holy is his name because of that. And then the, the song turns a little bit to a different way. It goes from what she, God has done for her to really what God has now done for us. Verse 50 says, In his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. We see she understood already what God's mercy was going to be. The mercy of God through his son, Jesus Christ, and, and the mercy that was going to be given for all of those who feared him, all of those who who had faith in Christ. We see the mercy through his son coming through right here in her song. And then she starts kind of preparing I believe us as we read these words, the people as they heard these words of how God would rule. It would be different than what most people expected. It wasn't the king that everybody thought they were going to get. It wasn't the, the ruler who was going to rule well. Jesus was going to come to this earth and he was going to do things differently. And the people, that's there's, there's part of the reason why that, that Christ would end up being crucified on the cross was that the people, even though that day, couldn't get their head wrapped around this because they were looking for something very different. They were looking for a deliverer, but more of a deliverer from their enemies and a, deliver, a deliverer who would, would rule strongly and would, and would be in charge. Well, he would be in charge, but it would be a very different way. And she begins 
portraying that here in, in the middle of verse 51. It says, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones. And he has exalted those of humble estate. You know, what he's telling us here is that those who are proud and those who are, are have, have strength, that as Christ rules, he will bring down those things and he will exalt those who are humble. He will use people that, that most would have never even dreamed of using. And you look at Christ's ministry as he walked this earth. He used tax collectors and people like that, that that most people wouldn't even have dreamed of ever even involving in ministry. And fishermen, and carpenters, and people like that. He, he That's the people he used. He would bring down the strong and he would lift up the humble. And then verse 53 he says, and he has filled the hungry with good things so that the hungry would be fed. No longer would they be, be found hungry, searching. It says in the rich, he is sent away empty. He would bring down the rich. The rich would become poor. The poor would become rich. He exalts the weak, the humble, the poor. You know, I was thinking about this this week, about some some of all the pressure that comes along with Christmas. It is a time where we should celebrate the birth of our Savior. It is a time where well, I, I'm just so excited about what the kids are going to do tonight because I've heard little things about it, and I just. I love it when kids portray this and when kids understand it and they bring that uh, to us. What kind of, I thought about this, what kind of Christmas celebration would God really be pleased with? You know, we, we've made it so much. And, and I love Christmas. I love Everything about Christmas. But we've made it so much. We've, we've put so much emphasis on the commercial part of Christmas that we've really begun to lose the real heart of Christmas. When I read these passages this week about how he would bring down the proud and lift up the humble, he would feed the hungry and the rich he would be sent empty away. I thought about, you know, all of the, the things of Christmas that we put so much emphasis on today really are of no importance to God. I just want you to know as parents, as families, it's probably not about how many presents you put under the tree. Probably not about how much your gifts cost that you've given someone. Let me just back that up. It's not about all that. Not probably. It's not about all that. It's about worshiping the Savior. It's about spending time with family and friends. It's about serving one another. I think back now, in January, it's been kind of a joke around the house lately. In January, I'll be 55. Man, I feel like I'm old now. Yeah. Man, I'm getting up there. Becky thinks it's funny because I can qualify for the senior discounts now. <laughs> and she can't. Not yet, but it won't be long. And I think back now about Christmas as growing up and all through the years. You know, I can remember some of the gifts I got. And I can remember the bicycle I got when I was 12 that I thought was so cool. And I can remember some of the things, the BB gun I got that I wanted so bad and some of those things. But, you know, I don't have any of those things anymore. They're gone. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know where they are or if they're even in existence anymore. But what I do have is the memories of all of those Christmases. 
And those memories were about family and friends and, and people. It wasn't about all the gifts. It wasn't about what we... I mean, I guess if I had to pick one Christmas that was the most special in my life was when my dad had been in the hospital for nearly three months and he got to come home the week before Christmas. That was special. That was what was good about it. And all of the... the you know, I, I think back one of my most favorite Christmases has even been just the last couple of years, last year actually, when we stood out in front of the sanctuary on Christmas Eve around the fire and sang Christmas carols and the kids all standing around with their candles. Oh, I loved that. It was about worshiping and praising our Savior. It has nothing to do with the, how many presents we got or how much food we ate or how, you know, it's not about that. And Mary understood that. Mary understood that she was going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. That was going to come in a, a different kind of way. He was going to rule very differently as the king. Things were going to look different. In verse 54 as we close this passage this morning, she understood what God was doing too. He has helped his servant Israel. And through God's faithfulness, he was bringing a Savior into this world to deliver his people in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. He would forgive them for their sins. Matthew 121. Mary knew that's what was happening. Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. What we see in this passage through what was revealed to Elizabeth and what was revealed to Mary and, and how John the Baptist had already acknowledged who Christ was. It's not over there in, in uh, what was that passage? Uh, uh, John 3, 29. That's not when John first re revealed the Christ child. He revealed it right here when Mary walked through the door. Through God's might and his mercy and strength, it's all wrapped up in Christ's birth. If you want to know who Christ is today, just look at what we've talked about this morning. The Savior of the world, brought into this world in an unconventional way, who was going to rule in an unconventional way, but who was going to deliver the world for their sin, from their sins. Folks, that is the blessing of Christmas. And that's the blessing I hope you look for this Christmas season. You look for blessings in what Christ has done for you. You look for blessings in what you can do for someone else. You look for blessings that are not necessarily about expensive things or things that make you bring you up in a status position because we see here that God's going to bring down the strong. He's going to exalt the humble. He's going to bring down the rich and exalt the poor. He's going to feed the hungry. And he's going to forgive their people, our people for their sins. Let's pray.